Welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us here at Church Online. We're so sad that we can't connect with you in person, but it's a privilege to be able to come into your home and to be able to connect with you wherever you are. So thank you for joining us. We find ourselves in a completely new reality in our lockdown, um, and I hope that your first couple of days of lockdown have gone okay. I absolutely love being at home with my family. It's one of my favorite things. But when you can't leave, it becomes a whole different mind twist, doesn't it? Um, and luckily, we spoke about patience and kindness last week. So I think we've all had plenty of opportunity to practice that. You know what they say, you should be very careful to pray for patience because then God doesn't just give you patience. He gives you opportunities to practice patience. Um, and so I trust that you have been doing that in your own life over the last week or so. So today we continue with our 40 Days of Fruitfulness series. And once again, we really prayed and try to discern whether this is the word in season that we need to be speaking about. Is this what people need to be hearing in the midst of this crisis and of these really dark times? And I felt that more than ever, um, this is the word that we need to be hearing because the world is going to be a completely different place at the end of all of this, whatever the end looks like. And nothing is ever really going to be 100% the same. But I do know this, that this is a call and a moment for the church and for every Christ follower to become like Jesus in more profound ways than ever before, to step up because at the end of this, we are going to need people. And even in the midst of it, we're going to need people who are more compassionate and more kind um, and patient, people who are more sacrificial and loving, people who are courageous um, in ways that we haven't yet imagined. And so the world is going to need us to be more like Jesus now than ever before. And so we continue with our 40 days of fruitfulness. Uh, for those of you who haven't been with us on the whole journey at the beginning of Lent, we spoke about how we are called to be fruitful, to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And our lives should really represent all of this from the spirit of God at work within us. It should be flowing out through us and manifesting itself in the fruit of the spirit that we find in Galatians 5, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And so we've, we're all almost kind of through that whole list today. We're going to be talking about this, the second last um, set of these, which is goodness and faithfulness. And so we really want to share with you what that looks like in our lives. How do we experience goodness and faithfulness and how do we cultivate those things? But before we get into that, I just want to say that I, I really believe that this is going to be as much for us um, a challenge in terms of our mental and spiritual and emotional health as it is our physical health. And one of the things that we know are really, really bad for mental and spiritual health is isolation and loneliness. And so please don't be disconnected. Please um, engage in the platforms that we make available. Please reach out to us. We're going to make a, a really big effort to try and connect with everyone over the next couple of weeks. But there are also two other things that we're going to be doing. So we have this online platform, but it's obviously not live um, just because of streaming issues and load shedding and you never know what's going to happen and so um, if you can watch a half sign on a Sunday that's great we can all do it together alone together but if you can't it's also available throughout the week on our website and um, but we are going to do two other things as well the one is we're going to have a Facebook live session on a Wednesday evening so please join us for that that's a more interactive opportunity and platform so you can find it on our Facebook page at seven o'clock on a Wednesday night so join us there for a midweek service as we just engage a little bit um, from a more sort of human perspective. And then also we're going to have online Zoom small groups. So Zoom is a video conferencing platform. It's free and anyone can use it. And so you can sign up to be a part of a small group that's going to be meeting during this time just to connect with people and to stay in touch and to discuss things, pray for one another. Um, and so if you'd like to be a part of that, please do let us know and we'll get in touch with you about how you can connect to a small group. So those are the two things that we're doing, and I really encourage you um, to be a part of that. So we continue, as I say, with our 40 days of fruitfulness, um, and we're talking about goodness and faithfulness. For our own sake, for the sake of the world, I truly believe that we need to be cultivating these things in our lives. So the first one is goodness, and I've been really led back to Psalm 23 over the last couple of days. It's um, often a psalm that I go to when I'm struggling and when things are really difficult and dark because it brings me such comfort and it's such a well-known, probably one of the most well-known scriptures. But if you really think about and contemplate those words, the Lord is my shepherd, 
I shall not want. It just brings such comfort to my heart knowing that I don't have to be in control because um, I really try hard to be in control um, despite myself, but I'm not. And I have to trust and entrust myself to the good shepherd, the shepherd who had laid down his life for the sheep. Um, and it continues with how he will make us lie down in green pastures and lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. And so I think we've all been made to lie down in a way. Uh, we can't rush out the door or go from one thing to another or have a thousand social engagements. Um, and so we've been forced to kind of stop and to do things differently and to be different in the world. And it's interesting for me, 21 days is the time it takes to really develop a habit. And so I hope that you're putting good habits into place good habits that can last beyond this in terms of your spiritual life and your engagement um, with God and with your family. So we've all been made to kind of lie down in the, these green pastures, but what's interesting for me about these pastures is that when I say the, the words green pastures, what pops into my mind is these lush green meadows, probably like a very English countryside that kind of style. And of course, this was not at all what they were talking about because this was written by someone in Israel and there it's pretty dry and arid and it's not like rolling lush green meadows. And so the green pastures that this refers to, and you may have seen a video about this a couple of months ago in church, and we pray shared about this, but the green pastures that David is referring to here in the psalm speaks about the hill country, kind of by the lakes in Israel, and the, the moisture comes off the lakes, and so it creates quite a lot of dew in the evenings. And so because of that, these little shoots of green grass, these little tufts come up, and the shepherds then take their herds and their flocks across these, these really dry mountains and they find these little bits of nourishment day by day. And so this nourishment and this provision that God gives for us to restore our souls is not a one-time thing. It's not like a stockpile, you panic shoppers. It's not a stockpile of stuff that will last us forever. It is something that we have to go to and get from God daily. And so we have to keep entrusting ourselves to him and his goodness to receive from him every day what we need. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been on a bit of a roller coaster. Like one moment I'm fine and I'm feeling just grateful to be where I am and in the position I am with enough food, that my family is safe, that we're okay, um, that we have a garden to go out into. I'm so aware of people who are stuck in tiny flats or shacks or really difficult situations in this lockdown. And so one moment I'm just really grateful and the next moment I find my heart gripped by fear and um, I have to try and stay off my phone and actually minimize the amount of news and stuff I'm reading because it's just not um, very functional for me to do. But my emotions are kind of up and down and things are really all over the place and so I have to keep going back to the shepherd. I have to keep going back to the goodness of God and finding him every moment, every day and trusting for his provision for my soul. David continues with this um, really well-known passage that speaks so deeply to where we are. So we walk through um, the green pastures and we lie down beside the still waters and our souls are restored. But then he says, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that's such a beautifully profound image, I think, globally and collectively, we find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult place to be. It's a really scary place to be. So my prayer is that like David, you would be able to say, I will not fear because you are with me. I don't know the outcome. I don't know how long this valley is going to be. I don't know when I will emerge from the shadows into the sunlight. I don't know whether that will even happen for me in this life, but I know that you are with me. And may you just take comfort, may your heart know that truth and let it sink in. God is with you. Whatever you are facing right now, wherever you find yourself, whatever uncertainty lies ahead of you, God is with you. David continues to say um, that you... You set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
And that really is our hope. That is why, no matter what, we can hold on to the goodness of God because it's not just about the here and now and about this life. It is about forever. And knowing with certainty that our good shepherd holds us and carries us no matter what. And so I really believe that David was saying that not out of a, a sense of naivety. He knew about the green pastures, but he also knew deeply, personally, profoundly about that valley of the shadows. And he says this about goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life. Um, not out of a place of just like, well, you know, everything's going to always be fine. It's like, no, goodness and mercy follows you even in the shadows, especially in the shadows. The goodness of God is there. I love the message paraphrase of that verse that says, Surely beauty and love will chase after me every day of my life. It's not a passive thing, the goodness of God. It is an active thing. It pursues you, even and especially in the valley of the shadow of death. And so David then speaks about this image of how he, he is overflowing. He's anointed by God, and therefore his cup can overflow. And that really for me is how we cultivate goodness in our lives. It's by experiencing and being filled with the goodness of God, like a vessel that is overflowing. When we are filled with the goodness of God to the point that we can no longer take any more of it in, it overflows into our lives and into every aspect of who we are and what we do. And the world can be transformed by goodness because we are experiencing and overflowing with the goodness of God. Romans 12 also reminds us, um, Paul says in Romans 12 verse 9, overcome evil with good. And that really has to be our response. It's a, it's a conscious decision that we make to overcome evil and difficulty and trials by responding with good. Um, I think if we, our natural inclination in times like this is to respond in fear and in selfishness. But our response has to be rather to be filled with the goodness of God so that it naturally overflows out of us. And then also to choose goodness. I've been so overwhelmed by some of the things I've been reading and seeing about people just responding in incredible ways in the midst of the most horrible human suffering. Sometimes the best comes out in people. And we've seen this in companies um, and manufacturing companies, car manufacturers that are now stopping operations and are manufacturing hospital equipment and just sacrificial decisions by so many people and um, healthcare workers and doctors. Here in South Africa, I read an article about so many doctors that have offered free consultations and telephonic consultations to anyone who is afraid that they might have symptoms and so many things are being done. There are people caring for the vulnerable and for the poor and for the desperate um, in really profound and sacrificial ways. One of the most amazing stories I, I heard was about an Italian priest who was in hospital and was really ill and he actually passed away because he insisted that they give his ventilator to a younger patient. There is no greater love, Jesus said, than to lay down your life for another. And we are seeing these incredible acts of goodness that overcomes the darkness. That is how we overcome darkness with light. And so I really want to encourage you, whatever good you can do, and get down on your knees and pray and ask God how it is that you can perform acts of goodness. And the more you do, it's kind of the more knock on effect it has. Um, and you may think, I can't do anything really significant, but a small act of goodness can overcome so much darkness and so much difficulty. So whatever that looks like for you, whether it's paying employees who aren't working, if you're able to possibly do that in your company, if it means reaching out to someone who is lonely, not in person, over the phone, um, if it means you know, buying groceries for someone who is struggling, whatever it looks like for you, do the good that you can. Also remember our challenge um, to clean out your cupboards. I read a thing that said that um, I always say that you know, I just don't have enough time to really clean my house and get organized. And now I'm realizing that time was not the problem all along. But anyway, so we have these, these weeks that we are at home, and even if you're working from home, you don't have to commute, you don't have to drop your kids to school, um, you have no other social engagements, so you have time. So clean out your cupboards, and we will commit to, at the end of all of this when we're able to meet again to collect all that stuff, kitchen things, clothing, whatever you have that you don't need, and that we will make sure it gets to people who really are going to need it. So take up that challenge, spring cleaning 21-day challenge as well. 
um, that's one way that we can just practically do good for those around us. So we're reminded that whatever, whatever we are facing, whatever valley we are in, we can know that God is with us and that his goodness is always there. It is a constant reality of our lives. And so may we press into it to cultivate goodness in our own hearts. The second fruit of the Spirit that we want to focus on today um, is faithfulness. And so I really want to share with you kind of three snapshots of people or groups of people that I think exemplify faithfulness. The first group is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and or as one kid in Sunday school thought their name was your shack, my shack, and to bed you go. Um, it is really difficult names to say and pronounce. But the story of these men you can read in Daniel um, chapter 1 to 3. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredible story of faithfulness in the midst of really, really difficult circumstances. So a brief synopsis of the story. These men were taken captive from Israel to Babylon. And so they found themselves kind of slaves in a foreign country. They weren't even allowed to use their own names. Um, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are their Babylonian names. And despite really difficult circumstances, they actually rose to prominent positions, and God really gave them his favor. And so they were doing quite well in Babylon. And then the crazy king Nebuchadnezzar had this enormous statue of himself made, and he decided that whenever they, there was music that was played, people had to bow down and worship the statue. And being really devout Jews, these men refused. They would not worship another god. And they would not bow down to an idol. And so even though the penalty was dead for defying this decree, um, these men refused. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls them in and he says, what on earth is going on? Why won't you listen to this decree that I've, that I've issued? And so let's read together in Daniel chapter 3 from verse 16, their response, which is truly incredible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Those are really some of the, the most profound words for me of faithfulness that we find in scripture. Even if doesn't. That is true faith and faithfulness. And the story ends well for them because we know that they are thrown into the fiery furnace, so that part's not so good, but they're thrown in, but they are completely unharmed. And all the bystanders see, in fact, that there's not just the three of them in the fiery furnace, that there's a fourth person with them. Um, and they come out completely unharmed, not even smelling like smoke, and everyone is amazed. And they all, in fact, end up worshipping the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because he must be the real God. And so God didn't prevent them from being thrown into the fire. And I wonder whether as they were standing there when the king said, okay, well, then basically off with your head in the fire you go. Um, they didn't waver for a moment. I wonder if they expected God to kind of change the king's heart or what it was that they were expecting God to do. But as they stood there, they're like, okay, well, looks like God's not going to come through. And they actually were thrown into the flames. I wondered what was going on in their hearts. And sometimes with us, God doesn't take us out of the fire. He doesn't prevent us from being thrown into the fire, but he is always there with us. And so we can really look at these men and look at their faithfulness. Um, that, you know, we, we want God to do a lot of things and, and to do things in a way that we would understand. And I don't for a moment understand why God would allow this global pandemic and why he doesn't put a stop to it when he could, because we know that he is the God of miracles. And um, I have to trust, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't do what I think he should do, or what I think he could do, I have to believe, even if he doesn't, I have to remain faithful. I and mean, that really for us is the lesson of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this incredible faithfulness that remains no matter what, even in the fire. And I pray that we will cultivate that kind of faithfulness in our hearts, that even if he doesn't, kind of faith. The next person that gives us a snapshot of faithfulness um, is Esther. And so you can go and read the story of Esther in the book of Esther in the Bible. It's a, it's a really interesting read. So it's quite a complicated, convoluted way that she got to being the queen of Persia, but 
Um, there's a whole lot of background about that, but the, the long and short of it is that Esther was a Jewish girl who became the queen of Persia, and the king didn't know that she was Jewish, but through a whole lot of a series of events, basically there was a genocide order that was sent out that the Jewish people were going to be annihilated. And so Esther could have just stood back and she sort of could have recoiled into the, the safety of the palace, um, and she would probably have been safe. But she had this difficult decision to make, and we see her faithfulness as well as the faithfulness of her uncle Mordecai, who encourages her to kind of speak out and to do something about this dire situation. So we read in Esther chapter 4 from verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And so she goes to the king and we read that this is not a really safe thing to do, even though he's her husband, because he hadn't called for her for 30 days. So she hadn't seen him in a month and you didn't just like pitch up and talk to the king. You had to be wait, you had to wait to be called. Um, otherwise your head was summarily chopped off just right then and there. So she really took her life into her hands to go and to speak to the king and to go and plead for the Jewish people. But she decided that she would go. And at great risk to herself. And so for me, that's what faithfulness really speaks about. It speaks about courage and it speaks about sacrifice. And so I wonder, you know, Mordecai reminds her, perhaps you were brought to this position for such a time as this. And I want to encourage all of us to think about what position have I been brought to for such a time as this? In this moment, in this crisis in the world, what position have I been put in? For this time? Why has God brought me to this place? And what could I possibly do with what I have and where I find myself to respond sacrificially and courageously like Esther? So my prayer is that we would really have the courage, um, as Esther did, to do whatever it takes to do what God is calling us to in this time. Maybe really pray about it and ask God to place something on your heart um, as to how you can be faithful to the call that he has given you. For all of us, part of that call is to stay away from other people, which is harder than we think. (laughs) And we're all learning that, I think. The the faithfulness at the moment means distancing ourselves from others and protecting the vulnerable um, just by keeping ourselves away from people. Uh, But how can you be faithful in such a time as this, as a parent, as an employer, as an employee, as a friend, as a family member? May we have the courage and the compassion and the grace of Esther and as we are willing to sacrificially be faithful. The last group of people that I want to look at today um, are Paul and Silas. And they found themselves in lockdown of a different kind. Um, And so I'm sure we can all kind of sympathize with them and where they found themselves. But we read about them in Acts chapter 16 and and they were going around spreading the gospel, and because of that, they got thrown into prison. And so I, I think sitting in the stocks in prison, um, none of us would have really been surprised if they, in the dark and bruised and battered, <clears throat> with their future very uncertain, um, because they may have been put to death, they didn't know what was going to happen. I don't think any of us would have blamed them if they responded with disappointment or anger toward God. You know, they were doing his work after all, for goodness sake. They were out there spreading the gospel, and here they get chucked into prison, um, and they don't know what to do. And their response is just a response of incredible faithfulness for me. They don't respond with anger. They don't respond with a million questions flung up at heaven. They respond instead in worship. And so we see that at midnight they began to sing and to praise, and then this incredible miracle happened where The jail was shaken and they actually escaped and their jailer was converted and a whole lot of things happened. But the point for me is their response. In times of crisis, in times when we find ourselves 
in places where we don't want to be, how do we respond? The response of faithfulness that we need to choose and keep choosing is in fact a response of worship. And I think that they could do that and they could worship in that place because they had learned and were holding on to the truth that God is always worthy of praise. Because despite our external circumstances, he is unchanging. His love and his mercy and his grace remains constant. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And although he often works in ways that we don't understand and allows things that we can't comprehend, he remains faithful in this life and in eternity. 2 Timothy 2 verse 13 says that he remains faithful even when we are faithless. And that's what's beautiful for me. Even if they did um, respond in anger and resentment and questions and all kinds of things, um, I think God doesn't want us to shy away from our emotions and be inauthentic with him. So he'd much rather have your anger than inauthentic worship. But even if they had responded like that, God remains faithful. And he is with us and he journeys with us. And so may we choose, by like Paul and Silas, to respond in worship. And the amazing thing about worship is that although it's about God, it's about giving him honor and glory. It's so amazing that the God, who he is just so kind that although it's all about him, he makes a change our heart. And he makes it something that benefits us. And so if we're able to respond in worship, it ignites faith um, and it helps to squash fear. So may we choose to faithfully respond to God in worship, even in the dark places, and even when we don't understand. So as you go into this week, whatever this week looks like for you, and for most of us, it's probably staring at a lot of the same people in the same places um, every day, may you be encouraged. And may your heart and mind really be set on goodness and on faithfulness. May you experience the presence of God in the valley of the shadows. May you know God's nearness, especially in this time, in the fire that we find ourselves in. And may you do the good that you can in whatever way you can. May you be faithful to God and to others. And may we emerge from this valley when we come back into the beautiful sunlight of God's grace and provision, having been refined, having really in this time been made more and more like Jesus. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we find ourselves in such uncertain times where there is so much fear, where there is so much suffering. But we pray, Lord God, that you would cultivate in us your goodness and your faithfulness. Give us the courage, Lord Jesus, to keep seeking you, to keep worshipping you, to keep holding on to you, that you may anoint us with your love and your faithfulness so that your goodness can overflow into our lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to become like you. Thank you that in this valley you are there. In Jesus' name. Thanks again so much for being here today. Um, we hope that you enjoy all the resources, all the kids things. There's a great little object lesson about experiencing God even when we don't see him um, for the kids. It's also good for adults. So you can go and have a look just below this um, in the kids section. And we really encourage you to also engage in the community time in the chat below. Just please leave a comment so that we can see where you are and how you are um, and how God has been speaking to you. We'd love to hear your stories about that. So we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. We have some really great Easter services lined up for you. We'll be doing a whole lot of things in Holy Week. Um, there's going to be a Tenebrae service, a Good Friday service, an Easter Sunday service, some Stations of the Cross that we're trying to imagine how we could do remotely. Um, so we'll be in touch with more information about that. But please continue to connect and we hope to see you on Facebook Live on Wednesday evening. And please remember to sign up for a Zoom small group if you'd like to be a part of that. All of our love to you and to your family. Stay safe, stay at home, um, and we hope to see you really, really soon.